study. Uh, foremost, may I welcome all our sundry to the continuation of our campaign, Zunday campaign, the great harvest. But the greatest of the harvest will soon come when our Lord comes. Well, meanwhile, we any visitor in the house, well, let's continue. Why we tarry expecting the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then after this prayer, the next voice will be that of our guest speaker, Pastor Tapiwa. Uh, on behalf of Pastor Rea team, once again, I welcome you all and look at the message yesterday, the genesis of all this confusion, pandemonial crisis, and life without Christ will be in crisis. But I know myself, with Jesus in the boat, I can smile at the storm. What of you? We can smile at what? At the storm. With the, I mean, Jesus in the boat. Because we see the crisis all over. And that's what the pastor was mentioning yesterday. We are now expecting the giant rock to come and level everything. But while we still tarry here, we continue to seek his face. Shall we pray? Kind, loving Father in heaven, once again we've come before your throne of mercy, throne of grace. Lord, take the glory and the blessings be ours. As we continue in this campaign, this is a wake-up call because our salvation is now nearer than before. It's a wake-up call. We might say we are very few here, but you are with us. We know things happen in the world. It was mentioned about the crisis in Gaza yesterday, Jerusalem. All over the world, it has been crisis galore. And there is no assurance that things will get better. If I is getting worse and worse on daily basis. But to we that we know and that we uh, realize that uh, everything will soon be over. Come and be with us so that we will not be discouraged. But we will be encouraged by tonight's message. So we can move nearer to your kingdom. And when people will see us outside, they will see your reflection. And they can come to know you more. So that many souls could be harvested to your kingdom. This is another message I pray for in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Good evening, friends. It's uh, yet another time when we have to share from the Word of God. Um, it's been almost two weeks now I've, when the pastor picked me up from the airport. It was last week on, uh, two weeks ago on Wednesday. Um, and when I saw him coming, it was our first time to meet. I uh, raised my hand at him and I said, it's me you are looking for. <laughs> and he said, how did you know that it's you? Because he had a little paper with my name on it, but he had not started showing it up. Um, I guess he was still trying to look for a holy face. Unfortunately, he couldn't find one because I looked like anyone else in the <laughs> at the airport um, but I, I noticed him that it was him who was looking for me and he asked how did you know that I was the one and I said I could tell the Adventist walk <laughs> <laughs> that's good well what he did not realize is that at some point in time I think after my name had come up in some of your board meetings he looked for me on LinkedIn and he asked for a request. And not knowing that he was the church pastor here, I have a habit of not, even on Facebook, a lot of people just ask for friendship. If I don't quite know who it is, 
because you end up with a lot of nonsense on your wall. So <laughs> I tend to screen. Um, so I didn't know who it was. Um, but then our elder Mgaza told me that the man who is coming to pick you up is our pastor. His name is Pastor Harrison. Bur and I said, oh, that's the name. So I quickly went to it. I quickly went to it and I saw the picture. So when he showed up, um, while I flattered him with the Adventist walk, <laughs> but I had already seen his picture on LinkedIn. But um, it's beautiful to be here with all of you. And I hope you are still following. If you really are keen as you are following um, closely, you will see that we are still talking about the two sides of good and evil. And the hope, the hope is that each one of us can pick a side. There is one thing we can never do for each other. Number one, we cannot convict each other of the truth. That is not a job that has been given to human beings. It is the job of the Holy Spirit to convict us and we can continue for a long time resisting the Holy Spirit while he's, he's talking to us. And you know, one of the ways I know the Holy Spirit is in my life. I, I just need to say this to you, my friends. One of the ways we know that the Holy Spirit is in our lives is not when we feel holy. I am, I am really skeptical about people who are sanctimonious and feel holy around others because sometimes they feel so because they are so far away from Christ that they don't see their faults. Those people who are, the closer we get to Christ, the more we begin to see our faults and our wickednesses and our weaknesses. And we don't feel so proud about ourselves. Now, what the devil does, the more we get to clo to closer to Christ and we see our faults, the devil begins to be the accuser of the brethren. And then he begins to say, you see all these faults? You are useless. Yet, actually, that is the voice of the Holy Spirit that is saying, come now, let us reason together. When I'm seeing my faults, it is not God condemning me. It is God saying, come, we can clean this up. So one of the ways I know the Holy Spirit is in my life is when I am still seeing the faults in my life and that I still have this desire to connect with him over my weaknesses and he is calling me to repentance. Are you with me tonight? So I don't know if, as we have been sharing, there are things the Lord is convicting you on. Please, when you hear God's voice today, do not harden your heart. Because the Holy Spirit is still speaking. He is still speaking. Again, one of the other things that we cannot do is to choose for each other. What has been given to us as human beings, and it's still, I still don't understand this. One of the questions I'm going to ask Jesus when we get to heaven is why he uses human beings that are failed that are that have their own weaknesses and failures to speak to other human beings i i think this was a job for angels but god still sends us to speak to other human beings i think the other reason is that so that we understand each other because we we we, we know each other we, we we feel each other but tonight uh without much further ado i am going to ask you to put your seat belts on because what, I, what we are going to share tonight from the seventh chapter of the book of Daniel might shock you off your socks. So I'm going to invite you because Daniel is going to lead us into history. But we are going to see some things that we have, we have seen around ourselves that we have grown to, to see as as the norm, yet actually these things, they came via the back door into the Christian religion. So I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you to pray. Um, um, I'm asking you to pray so that the Holy Spirit may give us um, an understanding and may give the speaker um, the depth that is necessary, that is not too deep, that is not too light. 
the temptation for the speaker is to go too deep so that people don't understand or to make it too light and, and, and lighten that which God wants to deepen. That is uh, the human uh, problem that we have as human beings. So as you pray for yourselves that you understand, please pray also for the speaker that he may say it in exactly the way God wants it to be said. Uh, at some of the places it's going to be turbulent, in some of the places it might appear very rough, but I want you to, to follow closely and if, 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 uh, if um, uh, it may call for it, check up and go and do your own research on some of the things that I'm going to share with you tonight. I think I've done enough warning and I think you've got your seatbelts on um, because it's going to be turbulent. Right, we go to our, to our screen. Okay, I always forget to put it, to switch it on when I begin. The, the, the title of our message, um, I was going to ask for some water. The title of our message tonight is The Rise and Fall of Empires. The Rise and Fall of Empires. I'm going to quickly go to ask you to open your Bibles. We're going to read from the book of Daniel, chapter 7, from verse 1. From verse 1, right through to verse, perhaps, verse 9. And then you may close your Bibles after that, because the, all of the other texts I want, they are on the screen. Daniel, chapter 7. If you are looking for Daniel in the New Testament, you are lost. Come back to the Old Testament. Come back to the Old Testament. Um, chapter 7, I'm reading from verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream. And visions of his, sorry, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while in his bed. Then he wrote down the dream telling the main facts. Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night. Behold, the four winds of heaven were staring up the great sea, and the four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion, had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it, and suddenly another beast, a second like a bear. It raised up on one side and had three ribs on its mouth between its teeth, and they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked, and there was another like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night vision, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had a huge iron teeth. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the other beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one coming up among them. Uh, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out, of the, out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking blasphemous words. Verse 9, I watched till thr thrones were put in place, and the ancient of days was seated. His garment was as white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, I thank you for your presence tonight. Father, we would see Christ. We want to understand him through this word tonight. May him alone be uplifted. Father, I pray that you may be with us tonight. 
and some challenging things that you want us to understand may be said tonight. I pray that you may be with the preacher. I pray that you may be with your congregation. Pray for the power of the Holy Spirit. Him alone who can convict our hearts. Him alone who can give us power to utterance. And we thank you, Jesus, for helping us tonight. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. The book of Daniel, we introduced the book of Daniel last night. And going back to the screen, as we introduced the book of Daniel last night, um, these are some of the things that I would like to remind you again tonight. Just a little bit about dating the book of Daniel. Around which time did Daniel um, live? Is Daniel actually a historical figure or is just some um, um, myth, a mythical figure that someone came up with? In the third year of the reign of Joachim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and, and besieged it. Now, right here, whoa, right here in the British National Museum, right here in London, I also found this, um, this, this inscription in that stone. This is an official document that chronicles important events in the reign of, of um, Nebuchadnezzar between 605 BC and 595 BC. It pinpoints that Babylonian, it pinpoints the Babylonian conquest of Jerusalem and surrender of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, at Jerusalem in 597 BC. This is actually, I took a photo of this from the British National Museum, which means there is a, a parallel historical record that is secular, that is not in the Bible, that confirms the biblical record. Are you still with me tonight? Um, Going back to our screen, um, this is the vision that Daniel saw. He saw four animals. He says, for some reason I lost. In his dream by the night, he says he saw the sea or the waters stirred up and four animals came out of the, out of this, out of the water one after the other. Now, I want you to remember that Daniel here is actually seeing a what? A vision. Now, this vision has a meaning. The meaning of the vision is not in animals. This is not a literal thing of animals coming out of water. This is, these are symbols that stand for something else. And tonight, we want to find out what exactly was Daniel being shown. What exactly was Daniel being shown? These great beasts which are four are four kings which shall ri arise out of the earth. So what are the beasts? They are the kings that will arise out of the earth. So we are not to expect some ravenous beasts that are, um, are horrible, but this is a depiction of political entities that would come out of the earth. That's what Job, that was, that's what Daniel is talking about. So Daniel is saying we have some political um, um, events that are ahead of us. Standing at his vantage point, he is standing around 6th century BC, around 600 BC. He is seeing the future and he says there are some political events that are coming that are going to be interesting. I think Daniel sees your day and mine, and especially about political events. Let me, let me say this ahead of time, my friends. We are not political people. We are apolitical. But we observe politics, especially as it fulfills the prophecies, because it's Jesus who said, I've told you these things before they happen, so that when you see them happen, you may what? You may believe. You may believe. So we know that Daniel is being shown. In fact, the Bible actually says that he saw these animals coming up out of the what? Out of the sea. And what is in the sea? Water. Daniel has a sister book 
called the book of Revelation. The same beasts that Daniel sees in, Reve in Daniel, they are also seen in the book of Daniel, in the book of Revelation. So sometimes some things may, say, may be said in the book of Daniel that we don't quite understand. If we go to the book of Revelation to read, we will find some keys to interpret the book of, the book of Daniel. For example, what could be the meaning of these waters? I would like for you, for those that have Bibles, I don't have it on the screen, it's just something that is coming to my mind right now. If you come with me to the book of Revelation chapter 17 and the verse is 15, scroll your phones, do whatever you have to get to this verse, or open your Bibles if you can. Revelation chapter 17 and the verse is 15 as we set the tone tonight. Verse 15. Then he said to me, the waters which you saw where the hallowed seats are peoples, multitudes, and nations, and tongues. I have a question for you. So, if the, the animals are kings that are coming out of water. So we now know that the animals are kings and political entities. Where are they coming out of? So these animals or these kings are kings that pres pres preside, not preside, preside over nations and many people, multitudes. Don't we ever say in English, don't we ever say, I, at that arena today, there were seas and seas of faces tonight. So Daniel is speaking almost from the same code of language. He is saying he saw the, the animals coming out of the waters, he's actually talk, or out of the sea. He's actually talking about many people. Many people. Um, so this prophecy is not actually hard to understand. In fact, now we begin to see that these four kings or these four political entities, oh, Daniel is actually expanding on Daniel chapter 2. When Daniel saw those four, four um, that, that image with four different segments, the head of, and the chest of, and the waist of, and the legs of. And Daniel, last night we discovered that the head of gold is Babylon, the chest of silver, Middle Persia, and the the waist of brass, Greece, and the legs of iron, Rome, and partly clay, partly the divided United Nations. And he says, in the days of those kings shall a stone come that is Jesus Christ. In the days of the united divided nations, or divided united nations, in the days, in our days shall Jesus come. We have this great hope of the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We look forward to that hope. But Daniel takes us on, a, on the same journey from a different perspective. Are you with me tonight? Let's move on and see what, John, what Daniel really wants us to see. This great beast that, which, that you saw are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. So we know that from 605 BC to 539 BC, the king, the kingdom of Babylon, reigned over the people. So which kingdom would this be? Which animal would this be? The lion kingdom is the first beast standing for Babylon. Are you with me? I want you to move with me. Let's move on to the second one. And the, behold another beast, a second like a bear, and it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in this mouth for, of it, between the teeth of it, and they, had, and they said thus unto it, Arise and devour much flesh. We know, according to your, to your museum again, we know that um, uh, Belshazzar, they, this a friend of mine was talking to me about this um, uh, last night, about this cuneiform here. Um, I was just trying to locate it on my photos. I couldn't find it. I found it today. Now, that cuneiform there, 
for many years, it became a piece of evidence. Because for many years, the critics of the Bible were saying the Bible lies when it says that um, the Babylonian kingdom was overthrown during the time of King Belshazzar. In fact, this was their thinking, according to the records, parallel records, there was never a king called Belshazzar. The kingdom was overthrown during the time of Nabonidus, the son of Nebuchadnezzar. That was parallel history. So for many years they were saying the Bible lied. Until recently when they came across this um, can you bring it back? When, they, when it came up, come across this cuneiform, do you want to know what is in that cuneiform? This cuneiform says, by promoting the God um, seen on Nab Nabonidus fell, fell foul of the priesthood of Medoc, the state god of Babylonia. His subsequent absence for 10 years at Telma in Arabia left his son Belshazzar as regent king. So Belshazzar went to live somewhere on an island because he fell out of favor with people. For some reason, he had um, their god that they were worshiping. He mishandled some priesthood stuff there. And they said, mm, there's something wrong with you. And he retired to an island where he, he lived for 10 years. And then his son, Belshazzar, took over. Now, the story of the Bible became truth again. And they said, well, with this kind of truth, what can we do? So we know that it was during the time of Belshazzar, and it's recorded in the book of Daniel, that during the time of Belshazzar, he took the utensils that they had captured from the city of Jerusalem, from the temple, and they drank wine, and they got drunk, and then they saw a handwriting. And today in English language, we do say, it was a handwriting on the wall. But it is borrowed from the hand that was seen writing on the wall by Belshazzar. And Belshazzar did not know what it meant until Daniel came and said to him, Oh, that statement, mene, mene, take on you for sin, it stands for your kingdom has been weighed and it has been taken over from you and it has been given to the Persians who were ruling together with the Medes. So we know the kingdom that came after the Babylonian Empire, right, where, whichever way you want to look at it, um, um, is 539 to 331 BC was the medo persian Empire. And record, history records that that's yet another, another uh, cylinder, which you do have here in London, sorry, uh, you do have here in, 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 in London, I showed you yesterday, that is Cyrus became the king, Cyrus the Persian became the king, taking over from the, from the Babylonians. So we know the kingdom that followed was the Medo Persians. Again, history and the Bible parallel are witnessing for each other. Let's move on a little bit. In fact, Daniel already foresees this in a, in a different chapter. I don't know whether we will have time to do ch Daniel chapter 8 in this time, in this, in this week. It's a powerful chapter that I hope you can study sometime and get it. But Daniel actually do, he does identify the kingdoms that would come after him 200 years ahead of time. He identifies them by name. And here it is, the realm which you saw having two horns are the kings of Med Media and Persia, the Middle Persian Empire. And the male god which you saw is the kingdom of Greece. And who was the king of the Middle Persians? I mean of the Greek Empire. Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great. He conquered the Middle Persians and he took over. At only 31 years of age, Alexander the Great had conquered the then known world. What America failed to do in the Afghanistan mountains by helicopters and all the GPSs and all the what, what, um, Alexander the Great did on horseback. He, but this is one thing that Alexander the Great failed to do. He took thousands and thousands of mile journeys 
away into the world, but never took a step inside himself. Just like Nebuchadnezzar, is this not Babylon that I have built, said Alexander the Great. We went, we saw, we conquered. Vene, Vidi, Vinci. What is there out there for me to conquer? That night, he drank. Some say he was killed by malaria. But some historian says he drank that night and drank himself to death. He conquered the world, but failed to conquer self. I don't know if there's anyone who's listening to me tonight. Some brilliant mind that is conquering the world. But one of our worst enemies that needs to be conquered is self tonight. Need to conquer self. We need to be humble. We, we achieve more with humility than with pride. In fact, the way up is down. We learned that the devil's failure was trying to go up by going up, and he came down. But we saw that Jesus went up by coming down. And that is the only way, my friends. So we know that after the kingdom, the kingdom that follows, that is the kingdom that looks like um, a, a leopard with four heads, is the kingdom of Alexander the Great. And why the four heads? History tells us yet again. History books, they tell us that when Alexander the Great died, when he killed himself by drinking, his four generals took over as if Daniel is telling us history right in the future. is telling us that the four heads represent the four generals that will take over after, Daniel, after Alexander the Great. Accurately, to a point, uh, some, of this, some of those of us that like to study, we find that there are now scholars that look at the book of Daniel and say, nah, this book is too accurate. Somebody wrote after the event and they've come up with a Latin term for it, ex eventu. Somebody must have looked at history and he's pretending to be Daniel and he wrote this. They actually come up with a date. They say it's written around 160. That's what they say. It must have been written around 160 BC because it's too, and their only argument is it's too accurate. My friends, yes, it's too accurate. Because our God walks into tomorrow. He knows, says the book of Isaiah, he knows the end before the beginning. My friends, I don't know what you're going through right now. Maybe tomorrow doesn't look promising for you. Let me give you this assurance. My God has been into your tomorrow. Just put your life into his hand. He will never fail you. I can face tomorrow because he lives. You can trust Jesus. Check his record. He's dependable. That's why I love the pro prophecies. Now, let's, let's move on. So that was Alexander the Great. And his four generals took over. Now, moving on from these four generals of Alexander, Ptolemy, and their lands that they went to lean to, to leave to live. Lismachus, Seleucus, Ptolemy, and Cassander. They they went to live around those four places, those four areas, um, and led the Greek Empire two hundred years towards the birth of Christ from all those uh, places. Alexander's four generals, they divide the empire but they support each other. But the fourth beast, says Daniel, shall be a fourth kingdom. Daniel says about this fourth beast, or this fourth kingdom. Are you with me tonight? Daniel says this. It shall be different from all the other kingdoms before it. 
and shall devour the whole earth and tremble it and break it into pieces. Now I want you to see something, my friends. As you follow history, history shows us that through its pages, there is still that line that divides between good and evil. That's why we find the Babylonians and the Egyptians, they have chosen to be on the side of evil by capturing God's children. Well, now I want you to really listen to me carefully. The children of Israel are, no, are chosen not because they are any superior. Are you with me? They mistook what God meant by being chosen. What God meant was, I have chosen you to evangelize the world. And they took it to say, oh, we have been chosen to be God's children and nobody else is God's child. Yet God had said in the covenant with Abraham that families of the world will be blessed through you. I'm going to place you in Canaan because that is the trade route right onto the center of the then world so that when people pass by you, you may show them my love. Are you with me tonight? But the children of Israel fail to understand. We find that the Egyptians, they fell on the side of evil and took God's evangelists, if you like, took them captive and they fell onto that side. So when we are looking at these kings, we are looking at the history of God and Cyrus being used by God to lead the, to lead the children of God, God's evangelists, out of the captivity of Babylon. We see again Babylon falling onto the side of evil by capturing God's evangelists. And God says to Jeremiah, I've sent you there to Babylon so that you can be shining lights. So God allowed them, allowed them to be captured. In fact, it's the devil who captured them. But God took advantage of the devil's moves. Uh, you are not with me tonight. God took advantage, and God does this every time. When he says, consider it all joy when you suffer tribulations. It's not God who is tempting us. It's not God who is letting those tribulations upon us. For God does not tempt men with evil, says the Bible. It's the devil who is doing that. But what God does is the devil takes a move against us. God says, let him do it. Let him do it. I'm going to create a good character out of this person through this tribulation. I'm going to allow this tribulation to make this person to be patient, to, be a little, to have a little bit more endurance. So God always takes advantage of this. So while they are there in Babylon, God uses Cyrus, the Middle Med Persian man, to, to, to rescue them. And Cyrus is, is almost coming to the other side of history until the next kingdom comes. The Greek Empire. They tried to stifle God's message. Now I want you to see this. I want you to see this. There's a new kingdom. It's different from the kingdoms before it. It will devour the whole earth and trample it and break it into pieces. Daniel 7 verse 23. The story of Julius Caesar and Cleopatra. We know it. The year is around AD 50, AD 40, somewhere there, before Christ. BC rather, not AD. BC, before Christ. The Roman Empire has been, has been slowly rising as the Greek Empire is waning. But what happens is Ptolemy, if you go to the south, if you go to the south, Ptolemy, who actually is the Egyptian king, when he dies, he leaves two of his children, they are twins, a boy and a girl. One of them is Cleopatra. You're with me. Now, there's a dispute between the two children. They were left as children, but um, Julius Caesar 
has been sort of left as a guardian over them by their father. That when they grow up, they will take over the reins in this dynasty of, of, of Ptolemy. But Cleopatra, there is now disputes between historians. Some say Cleopatra was a dazzler. I don't know what language you use these days to talk about a beautiful lady. May not be able to say it from the pulpit. But some say she was beautiful. Some say she was a manipulator. But history tells us that she asked her people to rape her in a, in a carpet. She was only 21, and Julius Caesar was 50 years old. Julius Caesar is likely going through midlife crisis. And his eyes, as the little gays, girls pass by in his, in, his, in his palace, he looks at them as they pass by. Whose child is that man? But one day, This parcel has come to him, wrapped in a carpet. He unrolls it. Out comes Cleopatra. History says he liked what he saw. And as he was just about to jump, maybe I'm exaggerating here, Onto Cleopatra. Cleopatra says, no, 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 what's in it for me? Before we go there, you know I'm in a dispute with my brother, and you're powerful. Our father left you in charge of these things. So why don't you rule in favor of me? So Julius Caesar does. So what happens as the story unfolds, and Julius Caesar tells us a bit of it. I mean, William Shakespeare, rather. What happens is the other Ptolemy goes to the three other generals. And he says, guys, this guy is doing things to us, to our kingdom. So they come together to attack Julius Caesar. And Julius Caesar begins to realize, like I realized with my, with my um, tormentor as I was a boy, when I started fighting back, I discovered that he was all talk and no show. So Julius Caesar discovers that he can conquer them. And this is the beginning of the, while the Roman Empire starts around 160 BC, but we begin to find its strength around Julius Caesar. Here is the rise of the Roman Empire as it takes over from the Greek Empire. Are you with me tonight? What therefore it means, my friends, the fourth kingdom the fourth kingdom that Daniel is seeing is the Roman Empire. Without a doubt it is. And he says from 168 we know the fall of the Roman Empire to be around 476 AD. As you go through the city of Rome you find these icons that come from as far back as then. When Julius Caesar died, he started this dynasty, if you like. His sister's son, Octavius, takes over. We know him better as what? Well. Augustus Caesar. Now, there's a monument in the city of Rome for Augustus Caesar. There it is. It's actually this thing that you saw there. 
that's it. But I just wanted to zoom in for you to see the name of Augustus Caesar. Are you with me? Please, we, I, I can't preach through this because this is history. It says here, Caesar divine, Augustus Pontificus Maximus. Pontifex Maximus. So the title of the Caesars, whichever history book you, t you pick up, the title of the Caesars, the Caesars began to be worshipped as the priests of the gods. You can go through Tiberius Caesar, Julius Caesar, Titus himself, Domitian, they all had their own temples that were built after them because they were supposed to be gods. In fact, some of the persecution that went on in the first century for Christians around the time when John is writing the book of, Daniel, of Revelation in 1890, the persecution, the point of the persecution was that Christians were refusing to worship Domitian because he wanted to be worshipped. But their title that they went by was Pontifex Maximus. Are you with me, my friends, as we get into history? Daniel is seeing all this. Now, this is Septimus Severus, who was the Caesar from 145 to around 211. You will find his monument in, in the city of Rome. That's that get over there, very close to the, to the um, Colosseum. And let me just come closer so that you can see. There it is. There it is. It's called Septimus what? Pontifex Maximus. He was the Caesar from in, in that period of time. As we look at the icons of Rome. Now, where are we in history? As we follow, as we follow this Daniel chapter 7, we have come from the lion to the bear to the leopard. Now we are looking at this um, terrible beast. And as we follow, it's Babylon, Middle Persia, Greece, and what? And Rome. Tell me that we are together so far. Now, Daniel says, then I wish to know. Now, one of the ways of reading the Bible is to read it through the eyes of the author. Are you with me tonight? If you were praying for me, now wake up. This is where we were going. Now, whatever interests the author should interest you because that's where the message is. So Daniel says, then I wish to know. You better wish to know what Daniel wished to know. He says, I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful with its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured broken pieces and trampled the residue with its feet. I desired to know about this. Then Daniel continues to say, and I also wanted to know about the ten horns that were on his head and the other horn which came up. I wanted to know about the little horn which came up before which three horns fell, namely the horn which had eyes and a mouth which spoke blasphemous words or pompous words whose appearance was greater than its fellows. Daniel says, I wanted to know about this little horn. Don't you want to know a little bit more about this little horn? I'm interested in knowing about this little horn. Now listen to what the little horn did. I was watching and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailed against them. What Daniel is saying is that this little horn made war against the children of God and prevailed and massacred them. If you are a child of God, you ought to want to know about this little horn. Now, as we move on, I was watching and the same horn was making 
war against the saints and prevailed against them until the ancient of days. So it was allowed to do it for some time until the ancient of days. This is God, the one who has no beginning. is called the ancient of days because he is the uncaused cause. He says, until the ancient of days, say to the little horn, hitherto shalt thou come, but no further. I've allowed you, I've, I've kept quiet for a long time, like I kept quiet for 38 chapters in the book of Job. Now it's time for me to stand up until, come back onto the screen, until the ancient of days came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Oh, there is hope, my friends. But before that hope comes, the saints have to be killed. The little horn, Daniel says, I desired to know. The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth. We shall be different from all the other kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth and trample at it and bring, break it into pieces. The ten horns are the ten horns, Daniel tells us on verse 21. Are you with me, my friends? The ten horns are what? Ten kings which shall arise, shall arise from the Roman Empire. Now we know what this is talking about. And another one shall rise up among the ten horns, among the ten horns of the, of the, of the Roman Empire. And another shall rise after them. He shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue the three kings. Now, when we are talking about the Roman Empire, you people living in London you would know better than this. Who living in England would know better than this. There is a wall that separates Scotland from England. And you know it as what? Hadrian's Wall. It runs right across, separates. Who was Hadrian? Hadrian was one of the Caesars in the early second century, was one of the Caesars of Rome who ruled right through to England. And I wish I had time to tell you why the Hadrian's wall had to be erected. I don't have the time. Some people had ran away from the first century persecution. Are you with me? First century persecution from the city of Rome, from Asia Minor, during the time of Titus, around AD 60 to AD 70. They ran away there. These were Christians. They ran away right through from the mainland Europe into, into the British Isles and right, went right further up to Scotland, and we knew them as the Celtics. They held a very primitive Christianity that was different from the Christianity that was in the whole of Europe. Right through to the 11th century. I wish I had time to share that history with you, but that's not what I'm talking about tonight. It's beautiful history until Queen Margaret started persecuting them and changing their way of worship. If you go today to uh, Edinburgh, go to that um, castle in Edinburgh, look for the chapel, Queen Margaret's chapel. You will see her picture right there because she had a different way of worshiping than most of the Celtics. And she persecuted them until they all started worshiping like her. But for 1,100 years, this group of people had a different set of worship. Their headquarters was on a little island called Iona. That's where their, their pastors were trained. Take some time to go and visit those places and find those islands of Iona still hold those places, the, teach, the places where these teachers were taught. Oh, one of the famous people that came from this place, we celebrate we celebrate this person around March. I don't know here in, in Australia, we celebrate around March. His name is called St. Patrick. 
he was one of these people. But history around him has been mystified. It needs to be demystified. But, Pastor, that's not what we are talking about tonight. If I find time, I need to share this bit of history. Because the English people that live in England have forgotten this history. It's very important Christian history that we should always... You see, we always fall in danger when we don't learn from history. One of the reasons why we study history is so that we don't fall on the same traps. Let's move on. The ten horns of Europe are the ten, the ten horns are the ten kings who shall arise from the same kingdom, the Roman Empire, now we know. But he shall subdue three kings. Who doesn't know in history that there are three kingdoms that fell in the Roman Empire that were subdued? And I'll show you who subdued them. The Eruli, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals. In fact, we get the word vandalism from the Vandals that lived around North Africa, where they went, and Africans are still sometimes very vandalistic in nature. And we borrowed that word now into our English language. We call it vandalism. It's because of the vandals. They were destroyed from the Roman Empire. But I'll show you who actually did the destroying. This is the little horn that came up in the Roman Empire and destroyed three kingdoms. But it also says he also, what? Persecuted the saints and made wars. But something else he did. Follow me closely. Verse 25. I want us to read in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25. Please, this one, I don't have it on the screen. That's why I have written there, let us read verse 25. Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. Are you there with me, my friends, tonight? He shall speak pompous words, the little horn. The other versions will say he shall speak blasphemous words. Against the Most High, he shall persecute the saints of the Most High, he shall intend to do what? To change times and laws. Then the saints shall be given into his hand. For a time, times, and half a time. Now follow this. Follow this. Let's go back to the screen. Let's go back to the screen. Follow this closely. This is what's going to happen. He comes after the Caesars of Rome. So this is after 476 AD. Because we know the beast itself was the Roman Empire. And Roman Empire wanes or falls down around 476 AD. So we know that this little horn comes up after 476 AD. Are you still following? Right. Something else that it does according to the scriptures, Daniel tells us the ten horns are the ten kings that make part of this kingdom. Number three, he shall subdue the three kings, and we've already seen those three kings, the ruler, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals. And then, what else shall he do? He shall make war against the saints for how long? For this uh, period, for some funny reason, Daniel calls it for time, times, and half a time. Well, from Daniel's time, it made sense. It doesn't quite make sense from our time to say time, times, and, and half a time. We'll see what that means. We'll see that, what that means. He speaks blasphemies. What else does he do? He changes laws and he changes times. And judgment comes just after it. So it leaves this little horn. When it comes up, it's after 476 AD. But when it finishes, judgment starts. Why does judgment have to come? Now, let me preempt myself and say, judgment comes because, number one, he has killed the saints of the Most High. And God will come to a point where he will say, my children have suffered, enough is enough, time to judge has come. And we almost hear this coinciding 
with the message of Revelation chapter 14 and the verses 6 and 7. Then I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven with an everlasting gospel. And what did he say with a loud voice? Fear God and give him glory for the hour of his judgment has what? Has come. Because God's children have suffered for a long time. They have been killed for a long time. Now time of judgment. The ancient of days stands up and books are given to him and he judges out of them. Are you still with me, my friends? Now, here it is. It comes after Caesar's Rome. We've already seen that. Now, here I am reading from a secular historian. Remember? History and prophecy go side by side. Here is a secular historian, and I'm reading right before you. It says here, I'll show you the book in a moment. It says, long ages when Rome through the neglect, the neglect of the Western emperors was left to the mercy of the bar barbarous hordes, the Romans turned to one figure for aid and protection and asked him to rule them. And long ages ago when Rome through the, oh, I'm, I've just repeated myself. All right, sorry. And concerned the temporal sovereignty of the popes and meekly stepping to the throne of Caesar, the, vi the vicar of Christ took up the scepter to which the emperors and the kings of Europe were to bow in reverence through so many ages. Let me tell you what this historian, the American Catholic Quarterly Review, April 1911. What they're saying is this. As the, as the Roman Empire is waning, now the, the Roman Empire is getting divided from the east to the west. The capital of the Roman Empire is changing from the city of Rome is going now to what is called Byzantine in Turkey, which was then known as Constantinople, um, named after Constantine. So there is this um, gap. Because the, 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 the Western emperor is, Empire is being left idle, there was a lot of attacks. And these kingdoms come to the main figure in the city of Rome, it is the bishop of Rome or the pope of Rome. They come to him and say, rule over us. Actually, what happens is that the city, in the city of Rome, the pope becomes the next Caesar, such that all the kings and the queens of Europe bow down from then, begin to bow down to the pope as to the Caesar. You following? Let's read on a little bit. This is A. Flick, one of the historians, a rise of the medieval church. He writes in 1909, this is a secular historian, he tells us, out of the ruins of political Rome arose the great moral empire in the giant form of the Roman Catholic Church. Here it is, my friends. Let's move on still from secular history, and then we come back to the Bible. Let's go back to the icons of Rome. Did we see that Caesar, Augustus Caesar and Septimus, they are all called what? Pontifex Maximus. That was the title that came with the seat of being a Caesar. Now, when you follow through with the Caesars that came, with the popes that came, Pope Clementine was also called what? Pontifex Maximum. Pope Benedictus was also called what? Pontifex Maximus. Pope Pius was also called what? Pontifex Maximus. This is to show from the secular history the people that took over from the Caesars or the, who took over the throne from the Caesars were the popes of Rome. They've become now more powerful. Now we are still following just the history and the historical facts. Please don't lose me now. Let's go back to the Bible. It therefore suggests if what, John, if what Daniel wanted to understand, are you with me now, friends? Now pray with me so that we can understand this properly. It follows that if we have followed Babylon, and Medo-Persia and Greece 
and roamed the fourth beast. And Daniel said, I wished to know about this fourth beast. And the, the little horn that came after it and took over the rulership and presided over. I would suggest to you that from history, from a perspective of secular history, historical fact demands that we see this, this little horn as the ascendance to the, to the throne of Caesar by the papacy. So the little horn is papacy. Now, my friends, I want you to listen to me now because you may lose me here. I am talking about papacy as a system. I am not talking about millions and millions of people who are worshiping God in the Roman Catholic Church, who are God's children that he loves. You understand me now? I'm talking about the institution and the purpose that drove it. Now, let's, let's, let's look without, without emotion. Let's look at historical fact. Let's look at historical fact and see whether this fits the description. Let's see whether it fits the description. Number one, it came from among the ten horns of Europe. Did it? So, it is true. Number two, did the medieval church replace three of the ten nations? Let's look at that. It was the pope who overthrew the Aruli, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals somewhere here in, 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 in Northern Africa. History tells us that those three kingdoms were overthrown by the Pope as they refused to follow him. But I need to show you something else. I need to show you something else tonight, my friends. It came from the, from the ten horns of Europe. It also came from the medieval um, church. It came from the, replaced the three out of the ten horns of Europe. Um, did it war against God's people? I wish I had time to show you just from England the history of England. Around 1100, right here in this land, the British Isles, the blood of many people that sought to worship God from their consciences and were killed. Right for us to have this Bible, there is an English saying that said, Cambridge makes them, Oxford kills them. Do you remember that statement? Because when you go to Oxford today, there is a monument that stands right in the center of Oxford where there were four people that were killed. They were all educated at Cambridge and were killed in Oxford. It's right there in the center. Lotima is one of them. Remind me the other names. Cranmer is one of them. So we know that approximately 50 million people for a long time, for a long period of time, were killed through this system. Let me actually show you what this historian says. Oh, just going back to how the, this monument began to be used. It began to be used as a, as a place of torture and persecution for Christians that refused to, to worship the way they were being asked to worship. So we know that this is true according to the prophecies of Daniel. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time, times, half a time. And what on earth does this mean? Let me just show you what this means. Let me just show you what this means in a, in a, in a moment. The church, has, this is the Western Watchman, December 24, 1909. Here is the story when history used to be history. This is what it says, the church has persecuted. Only a tyro or novice in church history will deny that. When she thinks it is good to use physical force, she will use it. Don't you remember the Spanish Inquisitions? We now say, when you interrogate people, you are talking to your, to your, to your children or you're talking to your subordinates at work and you're interrogating them. Haven't you ever heard them say, what is this? 
Spanish Inquisition? What are they talking about? If they don't mean the persecution of the people. Now, I know what I'm saying unsettles us because it is not, uh, it sounds judgmental, but my friends, I want you to understand that in what I'm saying, there's no, no tincture of judgment at all. This is just historical fact. That is why I am saying to you, I know there are people that are actually from the system of the Roman Catholic Church that are going to be in heaven because they are worshiping God from the bottom part of their hearts and they mean it. What I am re particularly referring to is what Daniel is talking about. He says, I wanted to know about this. So please, my friends, indulge me as I continue with this, with this piece of history. There is no judgment with me whatsoever. Now, let us move on. He says, only a title or a novice in church history will deny that when she thinks it is good to use physical force, she will use it. Let me move on and say, does this fit descri the description? We have seen all those, all those points. She has, she has fulfilled them. But here, time, times, and times, and half a time, what does that mean? In Revelation chapter 12, the same time period is mentioned. I'm having to rush through this. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle. Now we know what the meaning of the woman from Revelation chapter 12, you remember? It's the church. She was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly away into the wilderness to a place where she's nourished for what? Times and half a time. That same period of time is mentioned again. Why is she going? She's running away from the presence of the serpent. It means there is a persecuting entity that is persecuting the woman, the church, for time, times, and half a time, which is similar to what Daniel is talking about, which is the same thing. But look, when you read verse 6 of Revelation chapter 12, the same period of time is represented in a different way. It means it is the same period of time. He says, then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there for what? 1,260 days. Now, look at this, how parallel. The Bible has a way of speaking. The way to interpret is the same thing is said one way, then they say the same thing in a different way, then you may know that what has been said before interprets what is being said now. So we now know that the half a time is the time when the woman fled into the wilderness to be fed. But here it says the woman fled into the wilderness to be fed for 1,260 years. It therefore means a time, times, and half a time means 1,260 days. Are you with me so far? Wait for it. It's coming. It gets even more interesting than this. It then says, the, when we do study the prophecies, we get to understand that one day stands for one year. How do I know? right there in the book of Ezekiel, who is a contemporary of Daniel. He is told of the time period that is being shown. When you have completed them, the 40 days, lie again on your right side. When you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Judah for 40 days, I have laid on you a day for each year. So 40 days represent what? Now, my question is, 1,260 days, what do they represent? 1,260 years. 1798, I need you to understand this. The Pope ascends the throne in 538 AD. 1798, Bethia, sent by Napoleon into the city of, um, of, of Paris and capture the Pope. And the end of the Roman Empire comes to an end, of the of Papal Empire comes to an end. Now, I have a question for you. From 538 to 1798, how long a time is it? Exactly 1,260 years. Exactly 1,260 years. The question is, if the head fits you, Wait. So we now know, without a shadow of doubt, according to the facts that we've been given, the little horn 
that followed the Caesars of Rome is none other than Papal Rome. Have I said enough that I'm not talking about the Roman Catholic people? I'm talking about the institution. My friends, we have seen that one by one, all those things, they've been ticked. Let's tick the box. But what about changing the law? What about changing the law? I wish I had time to show you the catechism of the Roman Catholic Church. That's the first commandment. Second commandment has been removed, and the, se and the tenth commandment has been changed to split into two to preserve the number ten. But that's not what I'm really after tonight. I'm really after this. Here is a historian writing. The new, Christian, the new Christians were as far as thinking and habits the same old pagans. Their surge into the churches did not wipe out paganism. On the contrary, hordes of baptized pagans meant that paganism had diluted the moral energies of organized Christianity to the point of importance. This is a historian, secular historian. So many things that had come from pagan rituals found themselves into the church. Let me just show you one and then we close for tonight. I did say you needed to put your seatbelts on tonight. I'm just going to skip all that because I need us to go home. We know, according to the biblical record, that when Jesus was here on earth, he told his disciples that when just before I come, you have to pray that your flight may not be on the Sabbath. This is Jesus talking about the persecutions just before he comes. Because what he had been asked by the disciples, how shall we know that the end has come? Then he says, you shall see by many persecutions just before I come. Just pray that your flight is not well. What it means is that Jesus was expecting that the Christians living just before he comes will be keeping the Sabbath. I have a question for you. How then does Christianity today keep Sunday? Now let me say this to you again. I have many friends, beautiful friends, and some of my family members that are wonderful and amazing Christians that pray to God and God hears their prayers. They are wonderful children of God that worship on Sunday. But when I have a conversation with them and I ask the question, how did Christianity begin to worship on Sunday, yet there is not one Bible text to give us such an injunction? Now, I want to show you that um, in the Bible, what the Bible says, after the second coming of Jesus, in the, I mean, after the, uh, the, the resurrection of Jesus, the early Christian church, how the early Christian church worshipped. Just in Acts chapter 13, the verses 42 and 44. So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Question. If there was a meeting on Sunday, what would they have asked? Hey, please preach to us these words tomorrow on Sunday when we meet at church. There was no meeting on Sunday. So what they asked for is that they meet when? The next Sabbath. If you read on in Acts 17 and the verses 1 and 2, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue. This is in a, not in a Jewish land. There was a synagogue of the Jews. When Paul, as his custom was, his custom, Paul, was to go and worship on the Sabbath day, just as it was Jesus custom to worship on the Sabbath day. Now, my, some of my friends say, no, pastor, the reason is because there was a Jewish synagogue there. What if there was no Jewish synagogue? Then I say, you only need to read Acts chapter 16 to realize that even when there is no Jewish synagogue, Acts chapter 16, quickly, it reads this way. Verse 13. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made, and we met and sat down and spoke to the women who met there. So I am saying to you, after the ascension of Christ, 
right to the end of the book of the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, that early Christians are still keeping the Sabbath. Question, how did Christians begin to worship on Sunday? Simple. History tells us that when Constantine came on the planet, I mean onto the scene, just before the papal came, he brought the church to the Roman Empire. He's the guy who brought the, 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 the Christianity into the Roman Empire. But he did not do it for ecclesiastical reasons or for biblical teaching reasons. He did it for political reasons, to gain political mileage. I see it every day. Sometimes people use religion to advance politics. Have you ever seen that? Um, Constantine was no different. He was just like that. He looked at all the people that were fighting in his, in his empire, and he said, what is one thing that can unite all these people? And then he said, in all, this, in all these places, the Christianity is already there. But this is what he did. His mother was a priestess of the sun god, which was worshipped on the Sunday. He then, on the council of, on the, on the synod of Laodicea, 325 A.D., put out an edict that Christians should stop worshipping on Saturday and start worshipping on Sunday. While the change of the Sabbath is gradual, but by 325 AD, we find that, bang, finally, Christians are asked, not because of, of the Bible, but because of political expedience. The Christians went on for a long time. 1,260 years. When the popes came, they took the same Sunday and moved on with it. We come to the 1400s and the 1300s, the Christians begin to protest against the Roman Catholic Church. One by one, let's start with Martin Luther. We could start even earlier in the land of England. Because Martin Luther is much, much later than some of the Reformation in England they started seeing that what we are doing is not in the Bible. These are pagan rituals. They begin to come out slowly. God was leading those men. Wycliffe, all those people, God is leading them slowly out of those, out of those things. But here's the problem, my friends. Are you with me now? I'm just about to close now. As he is leading them slowly out of the followers that followed after them, for example, Martin Luther, his followers were called the Lutherans. What Martin Luther had found from his Bible study, they said, we are camping right here. We are not going any further. But then, as you know, that some of his followers, some of his students, like John Calvin, they moved on, like John Knox in Scotland, they moved on a little bit further. But out of them, in, in a place in Switzerland, in Zurich, and in other places, the Baptists also came, having found out that baptism was supposed to be by immersion. So they came out. They are moving on. They refused to camp where Martin Luther and John Calvin had, had camp. They said, we have to move on with this truth. We have to discover the truth, more and more truth for ourselves. So they moved on. The Baptists moved on. And some of the Baptists, even here in England, they said, hey, but why are we worshiping on the... Why are we worshiping on Sunday? It's not in the Bible. Then came out the, the Seventh-day Baptists. They kept the Sabbath. If you go to Kent, you'll find some of those people that were killed in Kent for keeping the Sabbath. My friends, the truth was marching on. Slowly, the world was getting the truth. The Sabbath was coming back because Jesus knew that just before he comes back, the Sabbath would be kept. Now, my friends, the reason why we have gone all this journey is to discover how the devil has been working throughout the ages. But then we have been told, as we were reading Daniel chapter 7, I want us to close at this note. It says, I saw the courts were set in place and the action of days set, and the books were given unto him. To do what? To judge. 
Here is the reason why he was judging. It was because the truth had been trampled underground, had been trodden onto the ground. Are you with me, my friends? Number two, it is because the saints had been persecuted. But there's something that happens right there. He says, then I saw one who was the, like the son of man coming into the throne. And judgment was given to him. As we ended the book of Daniel chapter 7, he says, judgment was given to the son of man, not only for himself, but for the saints. My friends, here is what I believe. I believe that we are living at the time when the little horn has went down. We are living at a time when God is judging. Let me tell you what that means. Can I get closer to you? This is what this means. It means the preaching of the full truth that is found in the Bible. What judgment means is the preaching of the gospel in its fullest sense. There is a problem of the preaching of the gospel. Have you ever read John chapter 3 and the verses 16? Let's close with it tonight. And then you will see what judgment looks like. John chapter 3 and the verse is 16. It's one of those Bible texts that everyone knows, does, don't we? But I want you to listen to it carefully. I know I've taken a lot of your time, but allow me to ground it here for today. John chapter 3 and the verse is 16. You are there. Here's what it says. For God did what? That he gave what? That whosoever believes in him should not what? I am saying to you, my friends, from the warning or the fall of the little horn in 1798, God has held back the winds of strife so that the gospel may be preached, so that whosoever may hear will what? Now, this gospel is this. Here's the gospel. That if we sin, there is a savior called Jesus Christ. And sin is the breaking of God's commandments. All the ten of them, including the Sabbath commandment. Are you with me, my friends? So, but if we have sinned, God does not want to condemn us. He says, here is the gospel. Jesus died for you. So that you receive this gospel. But then when we have received Jesus, he says, go and sin no more. Go and keep my commandments. Are you with me now? Now listen to what happens on verse 17. Give me verse 17, my brother. Give me verse 17. Verse 17 says this. It says, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. The other word for condemn is judge. For God sent not his son into the world to judge the world. But that the world through him might be what? Verse 18, but he that believes in him is not judged, but he, be, he that believes not is already judged. So we are living at a time when this gospel is being preached. For the first time, the gospel in the new covenant has not been, has not been preached in its fullest sense until 1798. If you wanted to believe the whole of the gospel until 1798, you would be killed for it. But God has held back all that so that you and I may receive the gospel. That's why he's sending the messages through these three angels that are moving in the air. And their messages, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven. With a what? Everlasting gospel. And he said in, an, in a loud voice, fear God and what? For the hour of his judgment is what? Has come. So my friends, I'm saying, when we receive the gospel, we are not judged. But when we do not, we are already condemned. This is the message of judgment. We are living in the hour of judgment, of receiving the gospel truth. I don't know about you, my friends. I want to pray now. I don't know about you. It is for this reason that an African boy born of a father who is a spirit medium receives this gospel truth and says this is the only message that can give me hope or else I'll spend the whole of my life trying to chase after ancestors that are dead. 
But this is the gospel of a message of a Christ who died and resurrected and is sitting on the right hand of the Father, pleading on my behalf. I will rise up and my friends, he has given me hope. He has given me joy and peace. I don't have a lot in this world, but I have him in my heart and I have freedom and I have joy. I'm just asking, could there be someone here who is saying, Pastor, I love Jesus and I've loved him for a long time. I just didn't realize that there are things we have done in this world. I have been a faithful child of God for a long time. But living up to the truth that had come to my feet, I didn't realize that I need to go a step further and keep all of God's commandments. I'm going to make a call tonight. May you stand as I make this call. May you just make, may you just stand with me. You are realizing tonight, perhaps you have been raised as a Seventh-day Adventist and you have kept this Sabbath before among many other, other commandments. But you are realizing tonight that you let go of these commandments. And you are saying, Pastor, tonight I want to rededicate my life. I want to start keeping the Sabbath again as I did as a child or earlier on. If you are here, I'm spe specifically speaking to someone who was raised keeping the Sabbath, but they let go. I'm speaking to you. I just want you to raise your hand so I can pray with you. I see a hand at the back. May God bless you, my brother. I see my two, my two friends. May God bless you. May God bless you. I want to make another call. Tonight, I want to speak to a Christian who has been faithful. They pray to God. They, they do all the other things that Christians do. And I want to say to you tonight, my friends, it's not like you have not been a Christian before. You have always been a Christian. The reason why you are within the earshot of this message is because God honors the truth that you have lived up to. And God has a tendency that if you utilize the truth at your feet, he shows you greater light for you to follow. So there could be someone here tonight who God is showing much more than what they've been holding. And God is saying, my child, I've worked with you all this time. You have been talking to me and I've been talking back to you. You have been faithful to the light that I've given you. Tonight, I want you to move to take a step further and accept the Sabbath truth. There could be someone here who has been a Christian, but they've not kept the Sabbath. And today they've been challenged tonight and they're saying, Christ, give me power that I embrace your Sabbath truth. If you are here tonight, I just want you to raise your hand wherever you are. And I want to pray with you tonight. I want to pray with you tonight. May God bless you, my father. May God bless you. Could there be someone else? May God bless you too, my sister. Could there be someone else tonight? Someone else tonight. I know God is speaking to someone. Could there be someone else tonight? You have been a faithful Christian all your life, keeping Sunday. You have not known that what you have been keeping is not actually from the Bible. It came through this system that we have been talking about. And oh, no, 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 my friend. I am not saying you have not been a Christian. You have been a faithful Christian. That's why God is moving forward with you. If you are here tonight, just raise your hand. And maybe you're watching. You're watching through, through this, this miracle of technology. I would like for you to just text a message for someone to get in touch with you. Just right there, underneath there, just text a message tonight and say, can someone get in touch with me? That's enough for our team to come to you and they connect with you. If you are here tonight, just raise your hand. Many others have risen their hands, my friends. Why won't you raise your hand for Christ tonight? Somebody else. I want to make my last call. You are here tonight. You have not yet given your life to Christ. You're saying for the first time, Pastor, could you arrange that I get baptized and meet Jesus as my personal Savior? If this is your will, this is your wish, raise your hand. I want to pray with you tonight. Just raise your hand. Don't worry about other people. Just raise your hand. Just raise your hand. We are praying now. If you are watching and you want to be baptized, just text a message yet again and just indicate what you want and we'll come back to you. All you have to do is to just text a message and we will come back to you. 
But let us pray tonight. Father in heaven, I thank you for the time. You have bought us time tonight. We have extended just a little bit more. Father, in the heart of my heart, I know that you have been here and you are still here. Convicting our hearts. I don't know a person who raises their hand unless they've been convicted by the Holy Spirit. It is for this reason that I know that the Holy Spirit is here. Just like your voice was heard by Paul that night, that day as he was marching to Damascus, you were present but some others did not hear, but you had spoken. Others thought it was thunder, but you had spoken because you were present. Could there be someone here tonight, Father? As you were speaking, could someone have heard thunder? Could someone have thought it was a human being speaking? Yet your presence was here and touching and tickling their hearts so that they can respond. Father, who am I to close them out? Our, heart, our heads are still bowed and our eyes are still closed. There could be someone here that is still here tonight. Maybe the Holy Spirit is still talking to you. I don't want to close you out. For whatever reason of the three calls that I've made, you're saying, Pastor, I'm here. Please pray for me too. Just raise your hand wherever you are. You have not yet raised your hand. Just raise your hand. And God bless you. Is there anyone else tonight? Anyone else tonight? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the hands that have been risen tonight for your children that have embraced this truth. Father, we are not saved by preaching. We are saved. We are saved by your gospel. When you save your children tonight, I ask that I be saved, that I may be faithful to this truth. The whole team, the technical team, the leadership of this church. Father, we are also just as much sinners as anyone else. We need this salvation. Father, may the work through us, your work through us, may it be your work in us. And in Father, write our names in the book of life as you write the names of my friends in the book of life. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Tomorrow night, the message is called Strange Fire. If I had a choice of attending one presentation, if I had a choice of, pre of attending one presentation, it would be tomorrow night. Please grab someone, come with them as we share about this strange fire. God bless you.